Hey everyone, it's Sevi, and it's been a while since I've done like a face-to-face -face conversation, chat, video type thing. I've been dealing with a lot IRL while trying to keep up with content. I'm in a new room and the light just went out, but thankfully everything else is still functioning. Um, today, I wanted to talk about the GameSpot article slash interview with the Genshin Impact devs. I kind of had a part of the community, me included, quite disappointed, frankly. This interview had to do with a lot of things uh, post version 3.1, but the part that stood out was the Genshin devs discussion about endgame content, which I will expound on in a little bit. And before I get into that, I would like you to know that if, if you don't know my content or me that well, I'm not the type of meta slave player that is obsessed with like min maxing stuff. Like, yes, I do make guides on how to use characters well, describing pros and cons of a character, team composition, building, things like that. But I'm not the type of person who will tell you to not use a character because they're bad or because they're not the best. I firmly believe in enjoying the game how you want to enjoy it. I also don't solely play Genshin just for the combat. I really enjoy Genshin's story content, their exploration and open world content. There's a lot of the game that I enjoy, but I firmly feel and believe that combat is a central part of Genshin. Genshin offers multiple ways to enjoy the game, and I do enjoy it in multiple ways but the combat system is arguably a very very big part of it and there is a significant part of the player base that draws a bunch a lot of enjoyment from it which is why i think this topic is worth talking about so i'm going to be throwing a bunch of opinions out into in this video that you can disagree with me on you know, you don't have to agree with what you're seeing in this video. Obviously, if you disagree, then, you know, you can be nice about it. But anyway, this is like a conversation about about Endgame. And the thing is, Endgame has been a topic of conversation for actually a long time. Genshin is reaching its two year anniversary. It's been around for a while. It's still been the at the top of the market and it has held its place there. And Endgame has been a continuous conversation whether you're part of it or not whether you're a casual player or like a hardcore player or somewhere in between the discussion has been there and i haven't really chimed in because honestly up till now in my head i was like surely surely with all this discussion ongoing with the, with the community talking about it almost constantly surely genshin devs know that it's something that a part of the player base is looking for, right? Like, surely they would make something maybe at the two year mark. And here we are. And not only do we not have new combat based endgame content, but this interview drops where they basically say they don't have plans for it. And then they give a reason why that is honestly very quite flimsy in my opinion again you don't have to agree i'm going to show you the quote uh and that we're going to dissect that so yeah it's it's come to this point where i am choosing to chime in and choosing to throw out my opinion out there all right so all that being said i think we can start talking about exactly where the issue is looking at the article i'm going to be highlighting this uh question and answer in particular it reads are there any plans to release new permanent endgame content in the same vein as the spiral abyss and then the genshin devs answer this by starting with the Spiral Abyss is one of the most effective ways for players to test out their party composition and combat strength. I agree. It is. Uh, guide makers and uh, combat focused players, we use Spiral Abyss as a standard to test a character's and team's power level. It is the hardest challenge right now in the game. Beat X amount of enemies in a given amount of time. The faster you can do it, okay, the, the stronger you are, or maybe the more skills and, and strategies you know in beating it. The devs know that it's effective. The devs know that it's there to measure power level. 
And then they say, if we design another type of permanent endgame that is similar to the Spiral Abyss, it might end up creating excessive anxiety for our players. Not everyone is interested in Musk Grief. Okay, I can agree with the last part that not everyone is interested in Musk Grief. A huge part of the Genshin player base is casual. That's fine. Like these are these are players who log in, do dailies, spend a bit of resin, log back out. And they don't care if they're resin caps. That's completely fine. Not everyone is interested in musk grief. Valid. True. But what they're saying here, the, the first part of that second sentence, if we design another type of permanent endgame that is similar to Spiral Abyss. Now, you can interpret this as them saying that we're just not going to add a floor 13 or a floor 14 or the Spiral Abyss is not going to get taller or deeper. Uh, however direction you put it. You can interpret it that way, and that might be a safe and perhaps literal interpretation. And at least that still gives us a bit of hope for more endgame content. But the thing is, they started that paragraph by s describing a certain characteristic of Spiral Abyss, which is that it is most effective for testing out power level. And if that's the characteristic they are choosing to highlight, well, in the same paragraph saying that they don't want to make permanent combat-based endgame content that shares that characteristic, that is similar to Spiral Abyss in that sense of that characteristic, then that interpretation, which is the one I'm capitalizing on, is indicative of them saying that they are probably not going to make more combat-based endgame content. Yes, you can interpret it either way, you can interpret it the safe route, like, find no more Spiral Abyss floors. Yeah, okay. But then there's this whole thing where it's been two years. They have run several combat-based events, limited time events, over these two years. And yet none of them have become permanent. And maybe you can say that this has been a long time coming. We knew this in our hearts. They have had no indication, no sign of introducing permanent end game content. It's only now that they're saying it out loud that we're getting confirmation about it. Like, okay, maybe that's fair, but it's still disappointing nonetheless. Not only is it disappointing, but honestly, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense because in my opinion, they have no reason to not add end game content. I know that they cite the reason here, which is that it might end up creating excessive anxiety, but we're going to we're going to come back to that. The reason I say that it doesn't make sense is because Genshin has such a rich, complex combat system. I don't play a lot of games, honestly, but a lot of the creators that I talk to, creators and and players in my chat and in my comments, they uh, they say that Genshin has one of the arguably best combat systems in the market right now. And as someone who makes guides on the combat system, like, I pers I agree. It, it, this is a combat system that is made of four characters in a party and you can only use one of them at a time and you have to make them work together. It's based on different element types, different weapon types different characteristics, different skills, talents, different mechanics. There are even hidden mechanics that are involved in the combat system that players can discover for themselves and learn to exploit and use in combat. They have numerous aspects and facets to it, such as weapons, artifacts, artifact bonuses, builds, stats, things like that, that, that all enrich this system. And then they have reactions. I haven't even mentioned reactions yet. And, and the reactions are super cool, okay? <laughs> like... The, the reactions, even before Dendro, have been such a trademark, such an interesting part of the combat system. You can use like vaporize, melt, freeze kinds of things. And, and it's all, these are just various mechanics that you can use in combat. The combat system is there and it's there to be enjoyed and played with. And that is my first reason saying that they have no reason to not add more endgame content. My second reason has to do with resin. All right, so let's talk about resin. We have resin, it caps at 160 a day. You regenerate, you replenish that resin over time. And you can spend primos to refresh your resin, to add more resin to your supply. Because what do you spend this resin on? Well, you can spend it in domains. You can spend it 
on bosses, you can spend it on ley lines. These domains, they can they can farm talents, they can farm artifacts, they can farm weapon materials. Everything that you spend resin on has to do with increasing a character's power level. You don't spend resin to make a character look prettier. You spend resin so that you can farm artifacts which aren't even displayed on the character, but they do make the character stronger. Like, you don't spend resin to, for example, get more furniture for your teapot. You spend resin on a boss because it's going to level up your character because it's going to make them stronger. And resin is a very fundamental thing to Genshin Impact. It's it's one of the trademark things about a gacha game. You know, it's like your, your stamina system. It's this thing that is a limited currency that you can use every day to farm materials in order to make your character stronger. Stronger in combat. And resin isn't the only thing that does this, okay? Banners, characters, weapons, okay? You, yes, having a character in itself is very much a pleasure. It's very much an enjoyment. Like, whether you spend on it or if you save for it, yeah, great. If you pull yourself a character and because that is your comfort character because you just love your personality, then that's awesome, right? You have a brand new character that you can play with. But for example, a big reason or a big part of characters are their constellations. These are things that, again, you have to spend a limited currency for, this time primos, sometimes your actual money. You spend primos to roll for characters. There is no other way to obtain them except for the free characters. You have to get them on a banner. And the only way to roll on a banner is to use primos or like the free intertwined or free standard fates that they sometimes give. You get these characters, you get their constellations. What do these constellations do? They make them stronger. They make them better in combat. These are combat improvements. Okay, you get multiple refines of a weapon. It makes it stronger. It makes it better in combat. All of these improvements, obtainable things, they are designed to better equip you for combat, okay? Like, you don't pull Ito constellations because they make his arms more muscular. If they did... I don't know, maybe he would be six, C6 by now. You don't pull constellations for Zhongli because it's going to like make his voice deeper, even though that would be very attractive, right? You don't pull constellations for Yai because it'll change her skins or appearance. And that that's another thing. Even though Genshin has skins, like, wow, how many characters can I actually dress up here? Oh, I can dress up like six characters? in one extra skin they've provided out of the 50 plus characters genshin isn't even like an aesthetics focused game it is very exciting when they introduce skins but for example skins aren't something that you farm for a lot of other games skins are something that you can buy or you can grind for or that you can achieve from like the battle pass or whatever here in Genshin, you achieve them through limited time events or through straight up paying for them. The main thing that you are grinding in Genshin that is resin, these are combat things. And that to me just speaks of how central the combat system is to, to the fabric of the game. And that is one huge reason why I just don't understand why they wouldn't make more content that revolves around that and that services the players that are heavily invested into that combat system. You can argue that, well, isn't that what Spiral Abyss is for? Yes, <laughs> it is. That is what Spiral Abyss is for. But the fact that it's the only thing that is there, the thing is most other gacha games have different forms of combat-based permanent end game content. It's not just their Spiral Abyss, they have more things, more challenges, more cyclical repeatable content because they know that just one form of it isn't enough. So why can't Genshin do that? Why can't Genshin do the same? 
And it's true that Genshin offers more than the ordinary gacha game. It's open world, it has like so much more in terms of exploration, and then this the story is there too. It's it's a huge game. But it is still a gacha game, and they will devote resources to those other aspects of the game. But then why stop devoting resources to more endgame combat-based permanent content? And this doesn't mean, like, them putting more resources into that shouldn't retract from other aspects of the game. I mean, it's not going to make the story weaker. You can you can see Sumeru, it has a, it has a well-written story. They put in Dendro, and it's a very good addition to the elemental system. It's working great. So, like, why stop there? The combat system is one thing that draws in players. It draws in interest. Because, again, there are a lot of attributes to it that make it worth exploring. So why not make content that rewards that interest and exploration into it? Combat for that part of the player base. Content for that part of the player base. And if other gacha games can do it, then why can't Genshin? Let's talk about another form of endgame that has been like continually getting updates. This main form being the Serena Teapot. The Serena Teapot is a good addition to the game. It's endless fun. Like, if there's some part of Genshin that has aesthetics focus on it, it's the Serena Teapot. Because you can infinitely revamp your furniture, your outdoors, your indoors. You can change the setting completely. And yeah, you can use it to get rewards like I'm doing right now. And the, the thing is, the teapot... It keeps getting updates, like permanent optimizations and improvements. Like, for example, just this patch, I think. I'm pretty sure it was just this patch. They've updated it so that you can just automatically clip. You can automatically make furniture overlap with each other. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this, this whole clipping thing, this is something that teapot enthusiasts and teapot builders have been... It's a... They've been doing tricks like exploits or hacks to actually make it happen for themselves even before this was like naturally allowed in the game. This is something that, that players have been have been doing themselves. And I guess the devs decided to implement it naturally because it is a good idea that players had. Players wanted to do it. Players were doing it. So like, why not put it in? They put in an improvement that players wanted clearly wanted because they were already doing it so it's like why can they do that but then not give more to the end game combat based content that players have been talking about probably even before the serenity pot was implemented so taking that thought and then accompanying it with, again, the fact that you have all this resin to spend on character improvements, these incremental increases in, in, in your character power levels, like, okay, you get a new artifact that, hit, that has a better substat and then it improves your character's power level by like 1%. But if you've already beaten Spiral Abyss, if you can already do it under time, then what? Where really can you feel that 1% improvement or where can you enjoy that character improvement? So you see that Genshin is investing so much into the combat system. They even say in this interview that the, the Dendro reactions, they introduced more complexity that, that they are trying to work with. Yeah, there is a lot of complexity there and they are investing so much into it and they make players invest into it because once you reach like AR-58 or AR-59, what else are you spending your resin on if not building the characters you haven't built or further improving the characters that you already main? Right? Of course, I'm not talking about the entire player base. Again, we know that a large part of it is casual, doesn't care about the combat stuff. But I would argue that like it's not the entire player base that pays attention to their teapots either. And yet, as I've said, that teapot has been has been living the life, the dev's favorite, okay? The combat-based endgame content, you can argue that they've been putting that into limited time events. 
Like every version or, or almost every version, one of the limited time events is the com is a combat based event. And you know, those those game modes are nice. They they introduce different mechanics like limiting the teams that you can use, bringing in new buffs and debuffs, bringing in different types of enemies, bringing in different types of waves of enemies, bringing in different stages to the combat itself like they introduce all these new things they even introduce like roguelike uh events and these are fun like these are enjoyable sometimes they introduce one and and it's really good and a lot of content creators and players will be like hey this should be end game content because it's actually really good because it's actually really enjoyable and the thing is for a while like i thought they were introducing these events so and and then collecting like survey feedback about them so that eventually one of them could be turned into end game content yeah you could argue that maybe that feedback was just to improve it for the next time it reruns but then it's like it feels kind of wasted because you could also use that feedback to create and develop more content that is permanent and can be enjoyed by the rest of the player base because also remember that when it's limited time events not everyone is going to be able to enjoy that content new players are likely not going to be able to enjoy it because maybe they're maybe they're not in the region that is needed to access that maybe their characters aren't strong enough to even get rewards and hopefully they'll stick around until the next time it reruns so that when it does rerun they can get to know it they can feel it right but then they wouldn't have to wait for the next random time it reruns if, the, if it were permanent content. So why not choose a blueprint out of those endgame versions and make it permanent? One could argue that, well, if it's permanent, people are just going to get bored of it again, like Spiral Abyss. And that's fair. If you get bored of it, then okay, you're going to stop doing it. But at least it's there for the people who aren't bored of it, right? But it being permanent permanently accessible would at least be an improvement over it just not being there. Spiral Abyss in itself, again, it's a good form of endgame content, right? It's kind of standard. It's kind of standard. But there is a part of the player base that can just breeze through it. Maybe because, I don't know, they've been building their characters over the last two years that Genshin has been out. You can breeze through the Spiral Abyss usually just using like the national team or a variation of national team and then the other side is like i don't know a freeze team probably now that they've introduced dendro sometimes you can change that up but like the national team is just so good that you can use it for almost any type of content right my point is not only does is spiral abyss the only thing the only end game combat based content that we have right now but also it doesn't necessarily incentivize you to enjoy different characters and teams and again like the the various characters teams and reactions and team compositions are a huge rich part of the combat system and yet you can just use the same characters to beat Spiral Abyss. I'm not saying that this is inherently a bad thing because obviously it's good for those who don't want to go through the trouble of building new characters or go through the resin of building new characters but still want to reap the rewards of Spiral Abyss, right? That's, that's, that's completely okay for them. What I'm saying is that the opportunity is kind of wasted there in Spiral Abyss if that's all you need to beat it with, right? Like imagine endgame content where it doesn't just give you a blessing that incentivize that strengthens a reaction but it actually restricts you from using certain characters and the thing is we have had a limited time event like that there was a limited time event where you could only choose one character to carry over to the to the next chamber and that was actually cool that actually like brought a bit more deliberateness and thinking about your team composition in my opinion that was an enjoyable combat based content and then again why not just make that permanent why not just choose something that the that, uh, that players really liked and just make it permanent maybe maybe you're the type of person that does just prefer 
that these are limited time, that, that these are rotating, that they rerun um, every few patches that you have to wait like a few weeks in between. You know, maybe you like it that way. Maybe you, you like that there isn't always something to do. But I feel like if they made it permanent, you also wouldn't necessarily feel like it's always there to do. Between Spiral Abyss and Limited Time Events, I actually feel a bit more stressed or or lazy or dread doing limited time events because I know they are limited time. Spiral Abyss, I know, is always there. Even if I miss the Primo Gems out of this cycle, I know it's just going to reset and I can just go back to it. Those limited time events, I know that once it's over, I can't get those, I can't get those rewards anymore until like I guess the next the next event that comes back but the fact that it is limited time it actually makes me feel more FOMO than missing a spiral abyss cycle because I see the countdown timer it's like seven days left okay I'll put it off for three days four days left and then I start dreading it because like mm, I don't really like this pressure that comes with having to complete it in X number of days and then the event is gone forever. And then that's, that's like my, that's like the only opportunity I have to actually enjoy the event. For example, I kind of had to cram the last event. I had to cram it in one night because I was busy with stuff and I wish that it had been around longer for me to enjoy it. At least if it were permanent, then it would just come back and be there for us to enjoy at any point in time. I want to talk about that FOMO thing though. Genshin, in this interview, they stated that creating that type of permanent endgame might end up creating excessive anxiety for our players, for their players. I understand that there can be various sources of that anxiety relating to Spiral Abyss, whether it's because of the rewards or because it's just too hard because you feel like if you can't beat it, then you're a bad player or people or, or because there are players out there who are mean and then bully others for not being able to beat Spiral Abyss. Some of those reasons have to do with people being mean in general or parts of the community being mean in general. That is their fault. That is not the fault of the people who actually just enjoy the content and then and then aren't mean to anyone for it. That's not the fault of Spiral Abyss either. <laughs> in my opinion, Spiral Abyss is arguably like something that you can kind of control. As in, you can control what teams you put in there, you can control how you play, and once you get to know the waves of the enemies, yeah, sometimes there are layers of RNG uh, that make the enemies frustrating. For example, the Ruin Serpent. The Ruin Serpent was very frustrating because you couldn't predict it as well, but because you can control the characters and the teams and then your character builds and what you actually throw into Spiral Abyss and how you play, that level of control, it's actually, you know, it's up to you. To me, what gives you anxiety are things that you can't control, such as, for example, these things, artifacts, <laughs> like farming up artifacts and then seeing the main stat you want, but then it having shit substats. That is sad. That is frustrating. And then getting a good artifact with like three good subsets and then it all rolls into the fourth horseshit subset. Now that, that is even more frustrating because these are things that are like out of your control. And you know what? You might be numb to the feeling at this point because like if you're an AR, if you're a very late AR player, then you've probably been doing this for a long time. And you've been, you've probably been rolling artifacts for a long time. And then you're like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just, it's just a part of it. But like, come on, Genshin's RNG artifact system, if there is one thing that they could like alleviate anxiety on, it would, it should be this. Make it somehow a bit more predictable. And again, this goes back to the point that we're spending all this resin, all this resin to get the perfect artifact, to get the perfect build, and for what? For what more content other than Spiral Abyss? Anxiety inducing, like you can talk about anxiety inducing, maybe because you feel like you're at you're you're too casual or too low AR of a player to finish that endgame content. And at that point, honestly, like you shouldn't care. Because 
you're just not at that level and that's completely fine. Like if players are at that level, then they can get the rewards, but those are extra. Things that you can get at your AR, at your level, those are sufficient for you. If you're a, an AR20 player and you can't get to floor 9 of Spiral Abyss where like the AR50 plus players are, then you don't have to worry about that because enjoy the rest of the game. Like, enjoy building your characters. You're, you, it's a process. You don't have to feel anxious about the end of the process if you're still going through that process. If, if you're a player that feels anxious about that, then okay, like your feelings are valid. But Hoyo, especially as, as game devs or as a company, I feel like they wouldn't use that as a reason to not make more content, to not make more endgame combat-based content. Because one, there is still a part of the player base that wants it, despite the part of the player base that gets excessive anxiety from it. And two, because Genshin's entire business model is based on FOMO, which is like unease. It's anxiety. The fear of missing out. It's fear. It's like literally a fear, which is like the, almost the closest thing to anxiety. The anxiety of missing out. Uh, Aomo. <laughs> you know, missing out on banners, missing out on limited time events, missing out on primos, missing out on characters, missing out on weapons. This is a gotcha system. You wish for things and it's RNG. <laughs> they have a pity system for you because they pity your fear of missing out. <laughs> If they're worried, if they're actually worried about excessive anxiety from part of their game content, then they would fix part of their RNG, not stop adding more end game Genshin con get end game combat based content. In comparison to the rest of their their RNG FOMO based business model, that is a drop in the ocean. Now. You might be wondering, what should that in-game combat-based content look like? Honestly, I'm not a game dev. I did already talk about how I feel like they've been making blueprints for upcoming or for possible potential combat-based in-game content through the various limited time events that they've already been making, right? The, the blueprints are already there from the various versions. It's just like, pick one, make it, make it uh, repeatable, permanent that Th that's it that's your content right so maybe it's just a matter of which one and then how to make it better again i'm not a game dev and i actually and i don't have as much experience with gacha games so for those of you who have a clear idea of what kind of end game content end game combat based content you would enjoy let me know in the comments tell me down below personally the recent combat-based events that I enjoyed were, were that Sumeru Potions one. I really liked that. I liked the waves of enemies and then and then you get like the buffs that you have to activate and stuff. I liked the Hidden Strife event, Deluxe event. I thought that that was pretty fun because it was like I could do rotation after rotation and I can feel when a rotation doesn't work. I can feel like when my energy is short and when it does work, it's so satisfying. When everything comes together, when, when, when your DPS is like in its perfect um, DPS window with all the buffs laid on him. For me, that was fun. Maybe, maybe you're into Hyakun and Iki. Maybe you're into the Labyrinth Warriors. Maybe you are into those, but then have like a suggestion on, on what you improve, on what you would improve on them. Maybe you're a co-op player. There's also that. Genshin has a co-op capability that, that they have not brought into endgame content. Like where is permanent win trace? <laughs> where is permanent win trace? Like having permanent co-op endgame content is, would be so cool. Not just for farming domains, not just for open world shenanigans, co-op and game content. Where is it? Tell me in the comments what, what you would look forward to. That's that's really how I feel about um their answer here. Because they said afterwards that they referenced the TCG, which I'm excited for. I want to know what it's going to look like. I'm curious what the TCG is going to be like, and I, and I really hope I get to enjoy it. But they also basically use TCG as a reference to how they are focusing on 
different types of endgame content that isn't combat based. Whether it's TCG or the teapot or I don't know, fishing. Basically, that's where they're putting their resources in. Yeah, it is disappointing that they aren't, or at least they haven't disclosed any plans for for putting resources into extra endgame content. It, you know, you could argue that Genshin is just being secretive. They don't want to mention anything that they can't promise. They don't want to prematurely leak or announce anything. They wouldn't want like someone on their team to leak info before it's ready. I get that. I get that they don't want to have some kind of empty promise like the Nintendo Switch thing. <laughs> where's 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 Genshin on Switch, buddy? And, and and maybe they just want to save it for their live streams when it's all ready and Mr. CEO Dawe can announce it in full. They are very they are very articulate in their live streams when they're ready to discuss something. It's very exciting. I very much enjoy seeing the game devs and their marketing whatever and their marketing personnel like actually talk about the content of their game because they say so much about it. They manage to say so much about it. And I'm really annoyed because this interview like at the start of the interview, the, the the subtitle is "We spoke with the developers to learn more about what's coming after version three point one." And then you read the article, and then you learn nothing. You learn nothing about what is coming after version three point one, except for TCG, which they already announced in the live stream. This interview, honestly, it was pointless. <laughs> And and if it was published so that it could disappoint players in the way it's disappointing like my corner of the community, then fine, they succeeded. I don't know why GameSpot would publish this interview because it it had no substance except for Hoyo being evasive, vague, dodging questions, just not willing to discuss any info because there were because maybe the questions that they were being asked it, it, the, maybe the answers were just premature. Maybe it's true that it is all just in development. And if that were the case, if I were the interviewer, honestly, I would have sent a different set of questions. <laughs> instead, of, instead of publishing something that just says, we have plans. The plans exist. Genshin Impact is a game. <laughs> like that's basically what that's basically what the article says. <laughs> Genshin, yeah, they have had a problem with communication and you can read this both ways. You can read it as them being problematic about the way they said this, but you can also read it as them clearly stating that they just have no plans to add in more combat-based content. Permanent in-game combat-based content. Wow, what a mouthful. I'm not going to act like it's the end of the world. <laughs> like, obviously, life goes on. This is a game. It's a community. It's just one aspect of the game. It's not the end of the world. There's still a lot left in Genshin to enjoy. The stories, the characters, the music, the exploration. I'm really, really, really enjoying Sumeru. It's like the first time in so long I've been motivated to explore an entire region. It's fun. That doesn't make this less disappointing. But it also means that I'm not planning on quitting Genshin Impact anytime soon. And honestly, if, if what they say is true, that, that they're not going to add more combat-based permanent endgame content, and if that means that getting those incremental increases in power level are going to become more and more pointless, I don't know. Maybe that means that there will be less emphasis on combat. Maybe I can make more content aside, ju aside from just uh, Genshin combat. Maybe there will be other Genshin things that I can make content on. Because... Yeah, Genshin is a very rich game, but the combat system is also just so good. And why waste that? Why put a cap on it? Again, just just give me your thoughts in the comments. I'm very interested to know what where you stand. If you're a casual player, if you're just starting, if you're a new player, if you're a two years player, if you're an AR60 player, if you're a C6R5 player, where are you at? Again, you don't you don't have to agree with me. But it's a conversation. It's a conversation with dialogue that we can listen to. And and I just really, really wish and hope that the devs could be part of that conversation, that dialogue, that listening. And this interview just, it showed, made us feel like they aren't. 
so yeah that's going to be all for this video let me know what you think in the comments don't forget to leave a like consider subscribing if you haven't already i'll see you soon take care